all of you in congregation, those who will be online and those who might hear later on, I want to encourage you all to remember that Jesus Christ is the God that saves, sanctifies, and sets us free. We declare that redemption starts this morning in this house, in our lives. We are the people that will trust in you. We will be the people that will be defined as great faith. And we thank you for your redemptive power today, oh God. Are we happy that Christ is alive and living and amongst us walking? He is not anything that we have to make up or misbelieve, make believe in our minds, but he is existing. And I know challenges may be rising up and sometimes we can't feel it. But I encourage you in this morning, take a moment and just focus on him. Shake up yourself. Release yourself. Just, just shake your hand and release your foot. Take your hand to the left. Shake your hand to the right. Watch your neighbor and tell them just step two bits to the side for two minutes. Because we're going to exalt his name this morning. Lord, no matter what, I'm going to praise your name, oh God. Hey, Lord, I thank you for your redemption, Lord. Oh. I declare you. I know you rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sins. I believe. I believe my shame. My shame is taken away.
as the Lord who has never lost its power, have never ceased for a moment, even when it's looking shaky in our own eyes. It's not because he is looking shaky, it's because he is powerful. Amen. And we thank you that you are a God that is still blessing, that is still sustaining, that is still providing, that is still healing, that is still loving us in spite of us. Hey. trust me that's where faith is when we talk about the armor of God and we put in on that armor and that shield of faith is us actually trusting him that trust that trust we may not understand and he shows up as a good and merciful God I just want to read this quick scripture to you all and it's about thanksgiving I know it's kind of weird like when you're in a trial to give thanks 
But somehow with giving thanks, it changes over whatever it is that is happening in your mind. Even if the thing is happening, to still give thanks. In Psalm 136, verses 1 to 3, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to God, of God, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, of Lords, for his love endures forever. It doesn't stop because of your challenges. It still endures forever. It doesn't stop because things are good. His love endures forever. And he's still a good God. He's still a merciful God. He's still a loving God. He's still a God that sustains and keeps us. How much we love you, Lord. Because you first loved us.
bless you as Lord over our hearts, oh God. Just the mention of your name, the declaration of your decree of your glory. Nothing and no one can take your place. Kings and kingdoms will pass away, but you still remain on your throne. But more than that, we want to invite you in the throne of our hearts this morning. One of the saying is saying, Lord, you take control. It's natural for us to want to control and do the things that we are accustomed to doing, but I encourage you to release religion and allow the relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus to take full precedence. Hallelujah, God. Jesus. Exalt your name, O
your plants in, you put your seeds in and just continue to flourish it. It's your responsibility to spend time in the wood and spend time in worship. Like this right now, I encourage you like this. Look at your neighbor. Like the fact that your neighbor is standing next to you and you are praising. Look at the person behind you because I know sometimes you're so accustomed looking left and right. Look in the back. I know the little musicians can't check in the back, but look in the back. Even just that, that whole row of people behind you standing up, it's like this agreement to tell the enemy like I am tired, I'm fed up, but I'm still going to praise you, oh God. And I need a miracle. I want a miracle. And I have received my miracles right now, oh God. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, Lord. The work is complete, oh God. Oh, 
Hallelujah. God, we thank you. We praise you. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. We choose to put our trust in you today. We choose to put our faith in you, God. Hallelujah. Let's sing it one more time. I believe. God, I believe you're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles, Lord. I believe. Lord, I believe. I believe. Oh, Lord, I believe. I believe. Come on, sing it out. You're the God of miracles. greatness of God this morning no matter what it is that stands in your way no matter what giant what mountain he's still the God of the impossible he's still the God who makes a way where there seems to be no way he's still the God who is able to pop the Red Sea in theology we call him the immutable God the immutable God means that there is no shadow of changing he is the same yesterday today and forever he still has the strength he still has the power he still has the ability but he still has the willingness to turn your situation around to make a way where there seems to be no way for you. All you got to do is trust Him. All you got to do is believe. He said all things are possible to those who believe. Would you believe? If you say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. If you believe in your heart that what you say will come to pass. The word of God declares that it will happen. Oh my God, do I have somebody to believe today? Hallelujah. So you might be going through a trial right now. You might be going through a testing, a difficult season. I'm here to let you know that God has you. Hallelujah. He has you. Don't give up. He's in control. Amen. He's in control. And, and faith is what activates the power of God in your life. So you just keep on trusting. You keep on believing. Come on, somebody. Am I talking to somebody this morning? You keep on holding on to his word and his promises. Hallelujah. And he will make sure to bring his promise into fruition. Amen. Let's put our hands together for the King of Kings. Come on, make some noise. Hallelujah. I know you can do better than that. Come on, make some noise in the presence of the Lord. Come on, lift a high note of praise to the King. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy. God, you're worthy. 
Hallelujah. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our worship. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. It is such an honor and privilege to be in the house of the Lord and to fellowship with God's people. Amen. I count it a privilege and an honor. And I thank God for giving us the opportunity to connect with him, but also to connect with each other. Amen. As we worship God together in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Good morning to everybody. And those of you online, thank you so much for tuning in. It's always a pleasure having you. I am excited to be in the house of the Lord, but I'm also excited about what God has to say to us this morning. Are you excited about the word this morning? You may not know what the word is, but sometimes just because it's a word from God, you just, you're just excited. You're just elated to know that God is about to speak to you. Amen. Amen. Because the word is God's love letter to you. Amen. Do you know that? God's word is his love letter to you. And I know for some of you who were in love, are in love, <laughs> you could identify with what I'm saying. Amen. Right, sister? <laughs> Angie, <laughs> when a love letter is written to you, you get excited and you blush. Anybody could testify. All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> Amen. But this is God's letter to us. Amen. And he has so much things to say to us. And so let us delve into his word as we listen to what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to us this morning. Let us turn our Bibles to Joel chapter 1. And we are just going to read verse 11 and verse 12. Amen. We give honor to the servants of God in the house, Pastor Curris. Let us put our hands together for her. God bless you. Pastor Cyril as well. Let us put our hands together for him. Amen. Uh, Pastor Keon is not here, but um, I believe that he's watching online. So let us still put our hands together for him. Uh, amen. Thank God for him. Praise God. I just want to recognize the worship team as well. Let's put our hands together for the worship team. Let us thank God for them. Amen. Praise God. And put your hands together for yourself. Amen. Put your hands together for yourself. You are in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, you could be somewhere else, but you choose to be in his presence. And so I thank God for that. Verse 11 says, Be ashamed, O you husbandmen. Howl, O you vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. Verse 12. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate or the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because the joy, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Could we pray? Father, we thank you. We give you thanks, O oh God, because we know that you have been so good to us. We give you praise, O oh God, for who you are. You are the revealer of all secrets, God. You are the revealer of truth. And even as we posture our hearts before you, Lord God, this morning, I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you will speak truth into us, my God. I pray, Father God, that we will not just be hearers of your word today. I pray that we'll be hearers, but also doers, Father God. We will not just listen, my God, but we will receive what you are saying, and we will practice what you are telling us to do. I pray for us, Lord God, that we will not allow anything to distract us, Lord God, this morning. I pray, God, that you will fine-tune our ears to hear your voice, Lord God, through your word today. I thank you for speaking through me, Lord God. I declare that every word that will be uttered out of my lips, God, will be Christ orchestrated and directed. So, Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing our series on harvest, and I'm coming to a close, as I said before, and hopefully that we are able to close this morning. Amen. But we're talking about hindrances to harvest. A couple weeks ago, I spoke about uh, the hindrances to our harvest, and I made mention of six of them, and I want to continue the or the four. And so, if you do not know what we're talking about, if this is your first time here, we are in a season of harvest. This is God's word to us as a church, as a people. And um, throughout a couple of months, I have been uh, looking at the harvest season from a biblical point of view, of course. And um, we are coming to the close of 
not the season, but the series, all right? And so we talked about the things that could hinder us. And one of the things that I highlighted was that we must be cognizant of what it is that the devil is using to try to not just stop our harvest, but to destroy our harvest. And what I've recognized about the enemy is that if he can't stop the harvest, if he can't destroy it, he will try to hinder you from receiving it. Within the historical context of the text here, we understand, and I've already spoken about it, but I want to reiterate so that you could understand clearer for those of you who were not there before. Uh, Joel is speaking about a group of people who were in a bad place spiritually, and they were in a season of harvest, yet they were not able to appropriate the harvest that God had promised them. As we see in the text, we see that the locusts and the Kanker worm and the grasshoppers had come in and destroyed the harvest. The word of God declares that the harvest perished because they were asleep. They were not aware of what was taking place. And it is a typical example of what sometimes happens to us as believers because we are in a spiritual environment while we are in a physical world. And may I propose to you that the spiritual world is even more real than the physical world that you live in. In fact, the manifestation of the things that you see in the physical world is as a result of what is taking place in the spiritual world. So a person who is in tune with God is in tune with the spiritual world and knows how to navigate through the spiritual activities that is taking place in his environment. While we understand that the enemy has been cast into hell and we understand that he has been brought low, we also understand that he is roaming around seeking whom he may devour. So it means that he is somewhere working in our environment. But because he is moving in the spiritual realm and he is a spiritual being, we cannot see him with our physical eyes. And this is why he could deceive many. In fact, the Word of God tells us that in the last days, there will be deception, that He will deceive people. He will present things to us. And if we are not discerning, if we are not able to identify and recognize His move and His acts and His work, we will be fooled and we will be deceived and destroyed. Because before the devil destroys us, the Word of God tells us that he entangles us. He ties us up. Before he ties us up, he disguises himself so that we will not be able to notice him and to recognize him. And this is why it is so important for us to delve into the Word of God. Because the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet, but it's also a light unto a pathway. It is a light because it shows the things that are in the darkness. And if you're walking in the darkness, you will never be able to see what the devil is doing. Amen. The blind cannot lead the blind. Amen. They will fall in a ditch. But if you are tuned to God and you are in his word, the word of God reveals to us the tricks and the trickery and the schemes of the kingdom of darkness, of the devil. And so the more that you delve into the Word of God, He opens up your eyes through the Word and through the Spirit to show you these are the things that the devil is going to use to steal the harvest from you. And so I'm here this morning to create awareness, to open up your eyes to show you what other things that the devil are going to use, is going to use to distract you. And um, I'm not on number seven. So number seven. Ingratitude. All right? Ingratitude. And when we talk about ingratitude, we're talking about the postural position of being ungrateful. Sometimes God blesses us with things. He, do he opens doors for us. He makes ways for us. He blesses us. He pours into our lives. He gives us favor. But because of our unrenewed mind, and because of where we are in our relationship with God, we could be ungrateful to Him for what He has blessed us with. No, I'm not asking you to think of your neighbor. I'm asking you to think of yourself. Every one of us 
at one point in our lives could testify that we have been ungrateful to God. Amen. Have anybody complained about a situation that you're going through? Amen, sister. Thank you. Thank you for being so honest. I love, I love some folks in the congregation who would just raise their hands. You know, yes, I was ungrateful. <laughs> and it's true because we all have had these moments of ingratitude where because something, that one thing went wrong in our lives, we tend to just step into a mood of being ungrateful to God and start to fix our eyes on the negative things that are happening and magnify the negative things instead of the many blessings that God has been pouring into our lives. Are you there with me? But, but, but the scripture that I'm going to use to, to, to bring clarification on this is Psalms 103 and verse 2. From verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's, that's very powerful. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. But then verse 2 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Meaning, praise the Lord, O my soul. But then he says, and what? And forget. Forget not all his benefits. Forget not, not some. Forget not all. I don't know what you're going through. But I want to let you know that you have so much to be grateful and thankful to God for. And if you're not mindful, the devil could use your ingratitude to rob you from what God wants to continue to pour into you. Because there's a, there's a principle that God works with. If you are faithful with the little that he gives to you, he's going to make you Lord over greater things. You need to be grateful for what he has given to you right now. You want to enter into the season of harvest uh, where there is abundance and plenty but guess what you are you are complaining about what is given to you right now amen if you cannot be grateful to what to, for the gifts that he has given to you now do you think that he's going to give you other gifts <laughs> come on somebody if you if you're not grateful for the job that you have right now you, do you think that he's going to entrust you with something greater? Ingratitude could hinder you. So the psalmist said, forget not all his benefits. And verse 3 says, and he lists all of the benefits that he has in his mind. This is not uh, all that he has, but some of them he would say, look at this. It says, who forgives all thine iniquities. <laughs> when was the last time you say, God, thank you? For forgiving my iniquities. Amen. And he's very intentional about this. Iniquity here would carry the understanding of, of a, a type of sin that has held you in captivity for a long period of time. Have you ever been struggling with something and God delivered you from it? Come on, somebody. If God has delivered you and he has forgiven your sins, it is something to be grateful for. You don't just say, well, I thank God for the blood. You know, he has forgiven me and that's and you move on. No. The first thing that he makes mention of is that God, you have forgiven my iniquities. When I stand before you, I stand before you as though I've never sinned. Do you understand the sacrifice that was paid for your redemption, my friend? In fact, the Word of God tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no remission for your sin. But you are here, you are lifting up your hands, and you forgot that the reason why you are now qualified to stand in His presence, to worship Him in the beauty of His holiness, and to put life prostrate before Him, and to enter into the holy of holies is because the blood was shed, and the veil was torn, and access has been given to you. Sometimes we could forget. So the psalmist says, do not forget what has given you the opportunity to enter into that place of praise and worship to God. Come on, somebody. Then he says, look at this, the next part. Who heals all thy diseases. Woo! Have God, any, anybody, have God given you 
healing? Has God given you healing? Has God healed you of something? Come on, somebody. I, I am, I'm a living testimony of the healing power of God. I had so many complications in my body, but today I stand here healed by the power of God. Listen to me. My God is a miracle working God. He is a healer. Come on, somebody. And, it, and maybe you might not be faced with something drastic, but just the headache that you had that God healed is more than enough to give God thanks for. Sometimes things happen in our bodies that we do not even know about. And God healed us from it. And we, don't even, we, don't, we did not even know that that thing that God healed us from had the potential to kill us. Now, now not because God never showed you the gravity of it. The severity of it means that it was not serious. It was just a headache that God, no. Do you know that that headache was planned by the devil to destroy your life? Come on, somebody. There was a time when God showed me that he healed my body from something that was detrimental to the point where it was going to kill me. I did not know that. But God showed me. Are you there with me? So sometimes God does things in our lives and he does not always reveal to you the severity of it. But you don't have to know the severity of it and how serious it is because he has healed all my diseases. I'm going to give God a mighty high note of praise in gratitude. Thank you, Jesus. My God. Look at the next part. It says, who redeemed thy life from destruction. My God. When the devil sought to kill you on the highway. Come on, somebody. When, when you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and the enemy wanted to destroy you, guess who protected you? It was God who redeemed your life from destruction. He stopped the plans of the enemy from coming into fruition in your life. You better give God praise because ingratitude is something that some people struggle with. Be grateful. It says, look at this. Who crowns thee with loving kindness and what? And tender mercies. God doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to crown you with, listen, he has placed a crown of loving kindness and tender mercy upon you. Do you understand what this is about? You are, everywhere you go, you are experiencing loving kindness and tender mercy. Who does that? Only God does these things. Because of his love towards us. Everywhere you go, you are experiencing the kindness of God. The favor of God. But you take it for granted. You see, because the thing about it is when, when we have things going nice for us. And, and, and we wake up in the morning and we have breath. Come on, somebody. We, we wake up in the morning and we are healthy. We wake, it up, we wake up in the morning and we have stuff in our cupboards to make lunch and breakfast and all of that. Guess what? Sometimes we forget. You see, uh, the only time we will remember is when, when we wake up in the morning and we can't move our legs. When we wake up in the morning and there's nothing in the cupboard, you will remember him, of course. But David says, forget not all of his benefits, his loving kindness. He has crowned you with loving kindness. But don't take it for granted, my friend. Be grateful unto him. Bless his name because he has blessed you with so much. Look at the next part. Look at the next part. Who satisfies my mouth with good things. Why? So that my youth is renewed. You're looking good. When was the last thing you say, God, thank you for how I'm looking? No. You, you attribute your beauty to your makeup and your hairstyle. My friend, it is God who has been renewing your youth like the eagle. My God. Every, every time the eagle reaches a particular age, it breaks its beaks, it breaks its claws, it plucks its feathers, and it gets new life again. God says, I am doing that for you every time. So every time you, you get older, guess what? God says, I'm renewing your youth over and over and over again. That's why you're looking the way that you're looking. There are people who are, who, who are younger than you, and they're looking older than you because they're tied up in sin. But look at you. Come on, somebody. You're looking fresh. 
fresh and young. This is why you got to give God praise because he renews your youth like the eagle. Somebody need to be grateful to God. Psalms 104 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And then he said, Be thankful unto him. Don't forget the person who has blessed you. Amen. And um, to bring this into context, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 10 to 14, I'm not going to read it out, but I'm, I want to give you the understanding. The Word of God tells us that God spoke to the children of Israel and He gave them a warning. He said, when you have eaten everything and, and you are full and, and you are satisfied and you are enjoying the land, do not forget the person who brought you there. Psalms 74, 78, my God, and verse 10 to 11. This is so profound. It says, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. He's talking about the same persons in Deuteronomy that he told, do not forget. Do you know that these same individuals, they forgot he says, when you, when you are filled and, and you have received the abundance and you're enjoying the things that I've blessed you with, do not forget Psalms all the way. Some years after comes, and in Psalms 78, and the, the writer is, is reflecting on what went on in the past. And the Word of God is saying that they did not keep the covenant of God. Verse 11 says, and forgot His works. It is very possible for you to be enjoying the blessings of God. And it becomes a norm for you. It becomes an everyday thing for you. Ah, oh, I have money in my pocket, health, strongness of mind, family. I have everything. You go throughout the day. Not a thought runs through your mind to tell you, be grateful. Just say thank you, Jesus, for waking me up this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for the children that I have, for the husband, for the wife. Come on, somebody. For the food on my table, for the job that I have. Yes, the boss is stressing me, but at least I have something. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Be grateful. They were ungrateful to God. And as a result of that, when you, when, when you have created a culture of ingratitude in your life, it's easy for you to continue to just live life without gratitude. And so, after the psalmist talks about that, we see a new generation comes in and they adapt to the same culture in gratitude. God blessed them with the harvest and they were not even able to keep the harvest. Locusts came in, destroyed the harvest. And guess what the Bible tells us? They were drunk and asleep. Now, there is so much more that God wants to do in your life. But I understand in order for me to make room for God, I must be able to position myself in the right place for him to pour into me. Come on, somebody. And part of positioning myself is to let God know how grateful I am for what he's blessing me with. But also to say, thank you, Father, by faith that because I've been faithful in little, I know that you are going to open doors for me and you're going to pour more into me. So you're going to make me lord over greater things. So I posture my heart. I position myself to receive the abundance that God has promised me because I know I was faithful. In the little that he gave. Come on, somebody. One last point on this. Uh, two more. Two more points on this. <laughs> uh, Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. And Paul was talking to Timothy about the last days. And I believe that we are in the last days. And one of the things that characterizes the last days. Look at this. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. We see that. Covetous, boasters. <laughs> they like to brag about their accomplishments and about their abilities and so on. Proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents. Ooh, we have a lot of that. But interestingly, 
Paul puts this one as part of the traits or the signs of the last days. He said, people will be unthankful. People will be, this is a prophetic word though. This is a prophetic word. People will be unthankful, ungrateful. I want you to guard yourself against this. And I know that you might be saying that I'm guarding myself against pride. I'm guarding myself against blasphemy, unholiness. But maybe you might be taking unthankfulness for granted. This is a trait of the last days. And this is part of the kingdom of darkness. To be ungrateful. God, listen, the, the God of this world, which is the devil, he wants you to be ungrateful to God. He wants you to be unthankful. He wants you to take what God has given to you for granted. Because he knows how important it is for God when you are grateful to him. In fact, the word of God tells us this. Give unto the Lord the glory that is due unto his name. Let me just put it a little deeper. The word of God tells us, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. In fact, God wants us to always have praise upon our lips. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually. And this is not just the psalmist speaking. This is the heart of God that his people will live a life of gratitude before him and always be thankful. Every morning I wake up, I am thankful for the breath of life that he has given to me. The word of God tells us in the book of Luke chapter 17 from verse 14 to 18, Jesus had healed some lepers. And the Bible tells us that 10 of them went and one came back. One came back to tell Jesus, thank you. Look at this. Says, and one of them, verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, Jesus told them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as an act of faith, as they left, the word of God tells us that they were healed. Wow. Faith healed them through the word of God. But look at this. One of them came back. They turned back, and with a loud voice, what did he do? He glorified God. He was grateful to God. Look at this. And he fell on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet, and gave him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He was not even a Jew. But I want, to, I want you to pay attention to Jesus' response to the man's gratitude. Look at this. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? God's expectation is for you to return after he has blessed you, to return to him to offer up thanksgiving and praise. I hope you're not the nine. I hope that you are the one that came back and say, Jesus, thank you for what you have been given to me. Thank you for your blessings upon my life. Because it is Jesus' expectation. He was expecting them. He said, listen, you alone came back. Where are the rest? Expectation. And he says, go. I don't know what happened to the rest. But this one, he told them, listen, your faith has healed you. You are healed. Go. Are you grateful? Because gratitude is an act of obedience to God. It shows you what, how much you appreciate what God has given to you. Number eight. Let me just run through this one. Disunity. And I'm speaking from uh, a general point of view here. And when I say general point of view, I'm talking about the church. God wants us to be united as one. I've been talking about it throughout Bible study as we look at the word uh, togetherness. We have been talking about the importance of getting together and having unity in the body of Christ. And what the Lord is saying here as it relates to our harvest is that God cannot bless division and disunity. Okay? And so if you are part of disunity and division, uh, you are going to rob yourself from the blessings of God. Are you there with me? The Word of God tells us in the book of Corinthians 
First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 13, 30, 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Amen. God is not the author of confusion. And the context gives us the idea that they were in confusion. They were divided. They were doing their own thing. Everybody was, was doing their own thing and trying to suppress the other and oppress the other. But God says, I am not the author of confusion. I'm not the author of division. Amen. I want you to be united. So be mindful. Be aware of division. Don't be part of division. But I believe that when the body of Christ becomes united as, as Jesus wants us to be united, we will be a force to be reckoned with. When we are united, we create that level of influence in our world. Amen. In fact, the Word of God tells us uh, that when we are united, our, our unity creates uh, a message for the people out there. Jesus said, when they see how you are united, they will know that I am from the Father, that the Father has sent to me. Jesus said this, this is how people are going to know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. Unity. Somebody say unity. God wants us to unite together. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 tells us two cannot work together unless they agree. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25 talks about a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. But Matthew chapter 18 and verse 19 talks about if two shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done for them. For where the two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. My friend, if we would unite together, we will see the move of God because there is a cooperate anointing that God releases when the people of God is in oneness of mind and oneness of heart. The Word of God tells us how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together where? In the place of unity. For there the Lord has commanded a blessing. It is in the place of unity. That we receive the blessings of God. So if there is any seed of division in your heart where you feel that you're better than somebody and, and that you're trying to press somebody down to become something, my friend, get rid of this because this is a character trait of the, the kingdom of darkness. Amen. It is the kingdom of darkness that, seeds, that plants seeds of division in the church of God. Amen. And we must be mindful of it. And the word of God wants us to understand that we have the ability to discern division and the seeds of deception and division. Amen. The spirit that God has given to us does not lead us to make division or to, or to create division in the body of Christ. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but if the enemy has been playing... On your mind and sowing seeds of hatred and malice for your brother, your sister, my friend. Ask God to, to deal with that thing because it is detrimental to your spiritual life and even to the season that you're in. Amen. The word, a word to the wise is sufficient. Amen. James chapter 3 and verse 16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil work is there. Don't play with division. It is an open door. It is an open door for strive and it's an open door for, for destruction and evil works. Amen. Because most of the times, division is fostered by jealousy. <laughs> Amen. Why, do you, why are you jealous at your brother? Why do you envy your brother? That's the word of God. Why do you try to destroy your brother? We should love one another. How could you love God and hate your brother? Whoever says that they love God must love his brother also. Guard yourself from division. Amen. The book of Acts tells us that when, when they, Acts chapter 2, when they were in the, in the upper room, the move of God came because they were in one accord. Are you there with me? They were able to experience the move of God that transited the church from one level to the next because they were in one accord. But what stood out for me is in the book, is, is lower down in the text in, in verse 42 all the way down to verse, verse 47, somewhere about there. The word of God tells us that they continued steadfastly 
they remained united. They were in one accord and nobody had their own thing. They had everything in common. This is why they were able to turn their world upside down. No wonder they saw the move of God at work in their lives because there was unity. And when you create that atmosphere for God to move, my friend, you will experience the power, the glory, and the presence, and the anointing of God at work in your life and in your church. Any church who has unity is a candidate for the move of God. Division breaks and destroys our influence. This is why Jesus Christ said a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. It cannot function. It do not listen because God will never bless division and confusion. If you are divided in your home, if you're divided in your family, if wherever there is division, you are robbing yourself of the blessings of God. You pray, you ask God for stuff, you ask God to bless you, but you can't see the blessings. Why? Because there is a stronghold that is holding you and preventing you from experience the, experiencing the blessings of God. It's not that God doesn't want to bless you. God wants to bless you. There is, there is so much in store for you, but you must posture your heart. Wherever there is division, wherever there is strife, there is what? Evil works. Not godly works. Not the blessings of God. God will never bless you if you are a candidate of division. Amen. But if we would unite together. I remember in the book of Genesis chapter 11, the Bible tells us that these people at that time who were living on the earth decided to build a tower. <laughs> and they wanted to build a tower to reach to heaven. God saw their hearts. And he came down and said, listen, I need to do something about these people. Because these people are so united that whatever they put their mind to do, they will accomplish it. It caught God's attention. Because of how united. I'm telling you, we as, as human beings, if we really position ourselves in the right place, we will be a force to be reckoned with. You don't understand the power and the potential that you have. God came down and said, I need to do something about these people. Because whatever they put their mind to do, they will do it because of the unity that existed. If they had so much potential outside of the will of God, can you imagine when you find yourself in the place where you are right with God? My God, you are forced to be reckoned with. There is nothing that you will put your mind to do that you will not be able to accomplish if you are united under the covering of God. God recognized that he alone was the one, the only one, who was able to stop these people. Because God's plan was not for them to stay in one area. It was for them to be spread and scattered abroad on the earth so that you and I could be where we are today. But I'm talking about it from a united point of view, from unity. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, strive, endeavor, endeavor to keep the unity in the bond of peace. Purpose in your heart. Say, I'm going to be an agent of unity. I refuse to be part of division. Division destroys the move of God. The next point, number nine, I have just two more, right? Passivity. Being passive. And uh, when I talk about being passive, I'm talking about it from the believer's point of view, believer's stand and position, where he feels as though once it's the will of God, it's going to automatically happen. Have you ever met somebody, or maybe this is you, who say, well, if it's God's will, it will happen? Have you ever said that, or have you ever met somebody who has already declared something like that? If it's the will of God, it will happen. Um, I have some issues with that, because... Um, it is the will of God that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Will everybody be saved? You could answer. <laughs> Don't be afraid. No. Even right now, there are people who are in hell. 
Yet it's the will of God for everybody to be saved. But the reality is, we must participate in, in the plan of God. For we are saved by grace, God's part, but it is through faith. God's part, which is grace, your part, which is faith, your participation. What I've understood about the theology of salvation is that God never just put things in your hand. He puts it at your reach. He tells you, if you believe in my son, I have sent him. He died upon the cross. On the third day he was risen. He was ascended into heaven. He's sitting at the right. He has already played his part. Salvation has been extended for the grace of God has been revealed to all men. But guess what? You've got a part to play. you got a part to play to say, I want what God has for me. And, and it's not just saying, I want God, what God has for me, but reaching forward to get it. Oh my God. Paul says, I press towards the mark. And the reason why he said, I'm pressing, is because there are things in, in the world, there are things in my environment that is trying to stop me from receiving what God has promised me. God said, I've given to you the promise. I've given to you the land. The harvest is ripe. It's yours. But you've got to press through because there are elements, there are evil forces, demonic spirits that are luring around, roaming around, trying to stop you. And therefore, you cannot be passive. In your approach towards the harvest. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 tells us this. Very profound. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's what he starts with. We wrestle not. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. In other words, there is a fight going on, my friend. And, you, and in order to win this battle, in order to win this fight, you cannot be passive. It cannot be whatever it is will be. Kesera, Sarah. It cannot be that. It must be the violent take of it by force. Come on, somebody. It must be that you saddle up yourself, put on the armor of God, and say, I'm going into the enemy's camp, and I'm going to take back what the devil has stolen from me. Come on, somebody. For too long, the enemy has been dragging some of us. It's time to rise up and say, here's what. I know the harvest belongs to me, and therefore I'm going to take it. I'm going to come out of my comfort zone. And I'm going to come out of that place of passivity, hallelujah, and say I'm going to take what God has for me. Amen. The land was provided for the children of Israel. It was already there. But God says, I want you to go and take it. God never put things into your, ha into your hand. He placed it at your reach. Go get it. Come on, tell somebody, go get it. Go after it. But the thing about it is, the reason why you don't want to say it is because you're feeling as though you're not ready to step out. You are happy. You are contented in your comfort zone. Because going out and coming out of passivity will take you out of your comfort zone. It means that you're going to create, you have, you, you're going to make some effort. You're going to, it's going to take energy from you. It's going to take time. You don't want to do that. You give your time and your energy and your efforts towards everything else. Apart from your spiritual life. My friend, if you feed the flesh, what will you reap? He, whoever sows into the flesh will reap corruption. But if you want something spiritual, you must sow into the spiritual. Be active. Don't just come to church. Don't just be a church goer. Don't just sit on the bench every Sunday now and then. Every two, three, four months we see in you. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is just a pastor talking. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. You can't appropriate, you can't appropriate the things of God by being passive. Jesus did not say, well, you know, I came to do the will of the Father. And when the time came, he said, well, if, you know, if, if it's the will of God, let it be done. He says, no, no, no. He said, I, nobody takes my life from me. I actively, willingly give my life down. So when Pilate said, listen, your life is now in my hands. I could do whatever. Jesus said, who said that? Do you not know that the reason why my life is in your hand right now is because God has given it to you? When Peter said, let's, 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 let's fight and let's deal with this army. Jesus said, listen, do you not know that I could call legions of angels to come and set me free, man? 
I am doing this. I'm not just talking about going to the cross. I have to go to the cross. And I'm going to carry my cross. And I love them. Listen to me. Jesus could snap his finger and let that nail fall from that, from that soldier's hand and break his hand or whatever. Jesus willingly gave his life because he came for this purpose. And he's expecting you and I to do the same. Amen. Get involved. Get active when the devil comes knocking at your door, trying to attack you. Listen to me. You need to take on the whole armor of God, my friend, and speak the word of God and use the sword of the spirit. We are not just on the defensive side. We are also on the, def on, on the, on the offensive side. We are not just on the defensive side. We are on the offensive side. The word of God tells us, take on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when he comes with his life, guess what you do? You knock him down. You destroy the kingdom of darkness with the word. Amen. So make sure that you are clothed with the armor of God that you have on. Your full armor you have on the word of God to defeat the devil. Amen. Because he will come to you. And if you're not strong, my friend, you will fail. I'm telling you, if you're not strong enough, you will falter and you will miss out on what God wants to do. Because the Word of God tells us this. Before Paul tells him we are struggling, we are, we are wrestling against flesh and blood. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. He said this, put on the whole armor of God. And then he says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong, where? In the Lord. You cannot fight on your own. You cannot defeat the enemy in your own strength. You have to be strong, but in the Lord. And if you understand who the Lord is, know that the Lord is a mighty warrior. Know that the Lord, hallelujah, he is mighty in battle. He has the ability to destroy strongholds. You're not fighting on your own, my friend. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that you are weak. The word of God tells us he is strong when we are weak. Come on, somebody. Let the weak say that they are strong. Yes, in physical strength you are weak, but you are spiritual powerhouse because of the God that dwells within you. My God, the word of God tells us, if God be for us, then who can be against us? Stand in the strength of God and defeat the enemy. Hallelujah. Our glory be to God. The last point, number 10. Limitations. Limitations on God. Putting limitations on God. Limiting the power of God over your life. No, I'm not saying that you're limiting... God, but you could limit what God could do through you. You could limit what God wants to do in you. And it's one thing to look at somebody and say, yes, God could do that for them. But do you have that confidence that God is going to do it for you? Do you know that the same love that God has for me is the same love that he has for you? Amen. Yes. He loves you with an everlasting love. But you must learn to trust Him and not put limitations on what God could do in your life. Is there anything too big for God? Is there anything too difficult for our God? No, it is. It's not. The Word of God tells us with God, all things are possible. And you need to remind yourself that all things are possible with God. And you need to believe that. You need to remind yourself of it. And you need to stand upon that truth, my friend. Because if not, the devil will tell you that what you are believing God for is too much. It is too big. It is too, it's too vast. God will not do it for you. Although he is a great God. But who says he's going to do it for you? This dream, this plan, it's too big. <laughs> but my friend... The Word of God tells us this. He who comes to God must believe that what? That He is. He is what? The all-powerful. The omnipotent. Come on, somebody. The God who has the ability to do miracles. This is the God that we serve. So don't limit Him. Don't limit what God can do in and through you. It was Jabez who came up with this revelation when he was confined to the, to the walls of what, of what his mother told him. And his mother said, you are just a child of sorrow. Jabez looked to God and said, oh, that you would broaden my horizon, enlarge my territory, and that you would bless me. Come on, somebody. It takes faith to speak a prayer like that. 
because you know that you have been confined, you have been stigmatized, you have been marginalized by people. Now you are telling God to open doors for you, broaden your horizon because he recognized that the God that he served was a mighty God, is a powerful God. My friend, don't limit what God can do through for you and through you. The same way that he enlarged Jabez's territory, the Bible tells us that God blessed Jabez. And do you know that small, insignificant guy who was a child of sorrow became a scholar? And in Jewish history, he was known. This is why when he was introduced in Chronicles, there was no need to introduce Jabez from what lineage? <laughs> Jabez was honorable. That's how he starts. Jabez was honorable above his brothers. Listen to me. People might be looking at you and saying that you are insignificant. Your family might be insignificant. But when Jesus meets with you, oh my God, when your blood meets Jesus' blood, come on somebody, you don't understand the type of blood that is flowing through your veins now. I know that your family had some curses. I know that there were some generational curses that prevent your family from becoming anything. But now you are connected to the King of Kings. You are royalty. Come on somebody, you are peculiar. You are chosen, my friend. And therefore God sees you as his son and his daughter. And therefore there is an inheritance for you in Christ Jesus. God does not limit you. Therefore, you cannot limit what God can do through you. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and I love these adjectives. Exceedingly, abundantly. They're all saying the same thing. But I, I, I believe that he's emphasizing something. God is able to do it, but it's according to the power. That is at work in, do you know that there is power inside of you? There is something inside of you that the devil is afraid of, my friend. You have the power and potential and propensity to destroy the kingdom of darkness. This is why the devil wants to stifle your growth. Ooh. This is why he's sending these attacks to distract you. Because if you really come into contact with the purpose of God for your life, if you really walk with God, you will see what God could do through you. If God could take this small, insignificant, stigmatized little boy all the way from the remote parts of Dominica, my God, and use him to speak to thousands of people on such a platform as this. My friend, there is no way he cannot do it for you. I am a living testimony. You, you see what, whatever you see here. And there are some folks who don't understand what is happening here. Some folks who don't understand the story. I did not just reach here. The hand of God has been upon my life. And it is through Christ that I do everything that I do. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you need to remind yourself that same power that was at work in Paul, the same power that was at work in Jesus, that same power that was at work in Peter, in John, and all of the disciples, it's the same power that is at work in you. I don't know what the enemy has been launching at you and trying to distract you with, my friend. You've got the power to defeat the enemy. You've got the power to destroy his works. The Word of God tells us, Behold, I have given unto you exousia, authority to train upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't limit God. In fact, the reason why I put this as a hindrance is because when you limit the power of God at work in your life, it's a total disrespect to God. Who are you to say what God can do and what he cannot do? If I was the all-powerful God, and I created my people, placed my spirit, my all-powerful spirit inside of them, and they stand up looking at me and say, God, I cannot do this. I would slap you. I would tell <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not saying that God would slap you. Be careful. I would. <laughs> this is just me and my kind of self speaking, right? Amen. Let, let me come back to the spirit. <laughs> Ain't you what to? <laughs> this is disrespectful. Because I have what it takes to deliver you. And you're, tell, and you're crying to me about my lack of ability to help you. 
God is not just able to do. God is willing to do, my friend. Have you understood the heart of God about you? Come on, somebody. No wonder. Listen, the word of God tells us this, that there is nothing that he will not do to reach us. He will tear down heaven. He will tear down the clouds to get to you, my friend. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Come on, worship him. Coming after me. Can I ask you to stand? There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Come on, come on. You got to be my choir. They're not, they're not there yet. Come on. Oh, there's no shadow you won't. Come on, sing it out. Coming after me. Oh, there's no wall. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't. Come on, just speak it out to him. Oh, there's no shadow you won't light up. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. Somebody needs to believe him today. I want you to think about the presence of God right now. Come on. There's no Reach out to him. There's no shadow. There's no shadow. Just 
soak in this love right now. Come on. He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. Somebody's being ministered to right now. Come on. Chases me. Song, I want you to reflect on his goodness to him. No wall you won't down. What has he done for you? yourself to soak in his amazing love
something that happens to you when you begin to experience the love of God. Because His love is so overwhelming. It's beyond your comprehension. How could a God so great, so holy, so mighty, so all-powerful could love someone like me? I know it's unbelievable. I know it feels unreal, but it is. He loves you. God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son so that you, if you would believe in Him, you would not perish, but have everlasting life. Can you imagine this? While you were a sinner, going against Him, doing things contrary to His will, He died. And the Word of God says, if He did not spare His only Son, but He freely gave Him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? I know that you're faced with a battle right now. I know that you're going through a hard time right now. But the same God who saved you when you were going against him and there was no condition attached to it is the same God who is with you right now. And he's telling you, I can deliver you. I can heal you. I can set you free. In fact, I'm already moving on your behalf. Would you trust me today? Would you give me that problem right now? Would you give me that situation and watch me turn it around for your good? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. I want you to just fix your eyes on him right now, just for a few minutes. to him. Amazing love. Amazing love. Do you know it? I know it sounds unbelievable, but it is true. Spirit lives within me. You 
die. Come on, with confidence, I want you to sing it out. Sing, amazing love. How can this be? You're the king who died for me. How can the king die for his subjects? But this is the type of love that he gives. Amazing love. I want you to bask in his love right now. Come on. God has the power to break the stony heart. Yeah, some of you can't reach out to him because you have hurt, been hurt for so long. Carrying some pains and hurts has created a hardness in your heart. But the love of God has the ability to break whatever stone that is there. Would you allow him to enter into your heart right now? His love is powerful. His love is powerful. He's talking to somebody this morning who is reluctant to open up their heart to him. But he wants to deliver you right now. He wants to set you free right now. He wants to break these chains over your life and help you to walk in freedom. He doesn't want you to carry this weight anymore. He wants to set you free. He wants you to experience His love. Hold me close. Let your love surround me. Bring me near, draw me to your side, and as I wait, I'll rise up like the eagle. And I will soar with you. Your spirit lifts me on by the power of your love. Sing, hold me close. Hold, hold, hold me close. Let your love surround, surround. I will soar with you. Your spirit lifts me on by the power of your love. Sing it again, sing it again. As, oh, hold me close. Hold me close. Let your love, let your love.
your love, let your love surround me, yeah. Bring me near Jesus. Bring me near Jesus. Come on, talk to him. I want to experience your love. I want to know, I want to know what the love of God is. Care and I. I rise up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. Your spirit lifts me on by the power of your love, and I will soar, and I will soar. The power, the power of your love, and I will so with you, and I will so with you. Your spirit lifts me on by the power of your love. Father, my prayer this morning. It's for every single one of us, God, to experience what the love of God is. For your word declares that the Holy Spirit spreads the love of God abroad in our hearts and gives us the confidence that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are joint heirs with Christ. If we are joint heirs with Christ, then there is an inheritance for us. Our inheritance is one that does not perish. It's an eternal inheritance. One that cannot be stolen or taken away from us. Father, I pray even now in the name of Jesus that every single one of us will experience that love right now. Let us know, let us feel that love, God. And let us know no matter how far we have gone, no matter how deep we have been struggling and seen, whatever struggle that it is, God, that we're in, or whatever trouble that we're in, whatever circumstance that we have found ourselves in, that we are still loved by you. And that you are willing and ready to heal us, God. Deliver us and set us free. Do for your people what they desire you to do for them right now. Minister to that need. Visit that situation. Perform this miracle in the mighty name of Jesus. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to make him Lord and Savior. He died for you to demonstrate his love if you do not know him I want to give you this opportunity if you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart he's tugging on your heart and he's saying it's your time to surrender to me if this is you you're feeling that tug you're experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit would you surrender yourself to him right now? I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you are saved. It's that simple. Jesus comes into your heart, saves you, delivers you, writes your name in his book, and you are now called a child of God. That's it. Amen. And he takes over your life. And everything is going to be all right with him. Not that you won't go for challenges or trials, but he will hold you through the midst of the storm, through your trial. So if this is you this morning, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before your throne of grace this morning. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I confess that I'm a sinner. And without you, I'm lost. 
please forgive me come into my heart and save me I confess today that I will serve you all the days of my life Lord Jesus thank you for saving me in your name I pray amen this is a simple prayer amen if you said this prayer there is rejoicing taking place in heaven on your behalf amen and we are elated and excited about the decision that you have made so if you made this confession maybe you might be online or in-house reach out to us put your names uh, at, the, at, the, at the usher's desk and we will contact you we are doing Bible um, baptism uh, at the end of the month on the 28th of this month amen and if you want to get baptized feel free to reach out to us amen God bless you let's put our hands together for the King of Glory amen praise the name of Jesus we just want to be farewell to those online thank you so much for just being faithfully you know coming on and uh, being a part of what God is doing here at Life City Church God bless you